everyone. This is your host Prasha and welcome to a brand new episode of Her STEM Story. And today we have our very first guest on live stream. And today we are also live streaming on LinkedIn. So hi, LinkedIn family. So nice to see you all if you're watching this live. If you're watching this not live, recorded, then welcome to you as well, because our show has been around for a long time. This is the first time we're doing live streaming and so excited because the best the best thing I'm looking forward to is the comments and the questions for our guests as we as we do live stream. So thank you again. And the recording will be available on LinkedIn and YouTube and on all podcasting platforms, wherever you listen to her STEM story. So with that, today's guest is so exciting and the topic, I got so many messages from people because we're all figuring out what is cryptocurrency? Like, what is it? Why do we need it in our lives? And what's going on with Bitcoin? Like, no, I don't know. So I'm very excited to chat with Nikki Bassetti, who is a product manager and a cryptocurrency enthusiast and an Instagram influencer. So her story is amazing because crypto really changed her life. And I can't wait for us to hear that story together and ask her what crypto can do for you as a minority, as someone who hasn't started investing yet, and as someone who is new to this field. Because again, it's very complicated. And a lot of times, complex topics create a barrier to entry for minorities in certain areas. And we need to break that barrier of entry. And that's why we have Nikki here. And so let's talk to Nikki to learn more about her STEM story. Hi there, this is Prasha Dutra, and I'm passionate about helping you unlock your true potential in your science, technology, engineering, and mathematics career and beyond. Less than a decade ago, I moved to the US from India to live my American dream. I took my engineering career to the next level by starting my own consulting and coaching company while thriving at my nine to five job money, time management, career planning, and personal growth are all things we'll discuss here. From expert guests and their stories to my own lessons, this show is an ongoing masterclass in how to believe in your brilliance and conquer your STEM career with confidence. Get a pen and paper and get ready for an education you wish you had in school. This is Her STEM Story, the podcast. Hi, Nikki. Hey, how's it going? Good, how are you? I'm doing well. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you so much for joining us today. I have to admit, I'm a huge fan. At the same time, extremely curious about about the topic today. But before we jump into it, we would love to know a little bit about you. Yeah, so my name is Nikki Bassetti. Um, During my day job, I am a product manager at a e-discovery platform service where I specialize in authentication and security. And after work, I call myself a Bitcoin pop star because I talk a lot about Bitcoin and post a lot of content about it on my Instagram. Um, So that's pretty much what I do. Yeah, I love that. And again, before we jump into your story, like in depth, because I know there's so many great parts of it and how Bitcoin actually helped you as a student and also how now you're on a mission for uh, financial literacy for women and also advocacy for women in tech. Mm -hmm. I would love to know what is cryptocurrency? If you can explain it to us, that'll be awesome. Yeah, to put it in layman's terms, cryptocurrency is a way to send peer to peer payments without an intermediary. So today, when you send a payment to someone via a platform like Venmo or PayPal, the pr- the processing is actually not direct. There is a middle layer, which means it has to go through a bank or a clearing process, which means that sometimes if you've noticed, it might take a couple days for the transaction to go through into your account. And that's because of the intermediary. However, Bitcoin is completely peer to peer. There is no intermediary, which means that all transactions can happen pretty instantaneously um, without a third party or a middleman in the way. Interesting. So does that mean that there are chances of it being, uh, you know, more risky or less risky? 
I would say it's actually less riskier. So one example I can give is, so suppose I have family in India and I want to send money to them. It's actually a very cumbersome process to do that. Mm -hmm. You not only have to make sure that this bank account, this bank provider is able to send the money to like whatever bank provider you have in India, but there's also a chance that sometime the transaction could get lost in the process. So you don't even know if it's actually going to go through. Um, and not only that, but there's also so many domestic fees involved too. When you send money abroad, you probably know Frasha. Um, yeah. So because of that, there's so many barriers when you're sending money throughout the world. With mm -hmm. Bitcoin, there really isn't a um, transactional fee that happens. It can happen very instantaneously. So if I'm sending money to my family in India, um, it happens in a very streamlined process and there aren't any like additional costs involved. Mm -hmm. That's interesting because, yes, one of the things that used to be a problem when we were in school was, you know, getting the money from India. And I remember one time it was so last minute that the tuition had to go at like <laughs> at like four. And I'm just like praying to God that it comes through. <laughs> and it was so scary because you'd, ha you'd have this three to six day period where the money was in the limbo. And I know mm -hmm. as middle class and as people who didn't have a lot of money, my parents wouldn't sleep the whole time. So yeah. I'm glad that now it's getting better and better every day. And mm -hmm. with these technologies i'm sure um again as we were talking about a little bit about the barrier to entry for a lot of people mm -hmm. can can change as well because these processes can be very bureaucratic as well right so let's say if mm -hmm. i want to invest in somebody in their business or help them out if the money reaching to them has to go through all these different channels wow. um that can create problems too so that's exactly exciting. Mm -hmm. so Tell us, how did you get into tech? What got you interested? Where does your STEM story begin? Yeah, so um, when I was in high school, I always knew I wanted to be an engineer. Um, I loved math and science, and naturally engineering was a perfect match for me. But from there, I had to decide like what flavor of engineering I wanted to do, because there's so many, right? There's biomedical, there's chemical, mechanical, electrical, computer. Um, and I decided to focus on electrical. So I liked electrical because it gave me the chance to not only do software, but also hardware. I was undecided on what I want to pursue. And I think electrical engineering also provided me an outlet to do a lot of creative thinking. So my advisors always gave me opportunities to not only work on like just, you know, theoretical classes, but also real life application classes where I even got to make like web applications um, for moms who wanted to monitor their breastfeeding process to creating like just websites for like churches and like libraries. It was just so much fun. And that's what like sparked my interest in STEM and engineering. And now I still continue to use my tech background in a way that I get to help out folks with their authentication best practices and also teach financial literacy after work. Yeah, that's awesome. I think definitely one thing that you said in the end, if you are in STEM professions, you have more chances to have a more flexible career because yes. you don't necessarily have to work multiple jobs and you yep. could really have a lifestyle that allows for that extra side hustle or income. And I think previously, if you look at traditionally only majority people the people who belong to the majorities um, had that opportunity because they had so many resources at home. So I think STEM is definitely that pathway for it. And tell us a little bit about how did you get to the US? Uh, you know, what triggered that to move countries and continents? Yeah, so my family moved to America when I was three years old. Um, I came with my parents, so they just awesome. took me on the plane and that's how I ended up here. But I think there's so many opportunities in America that I'm just so grateful for. I think especially as a woman, especially being an Indian woman, I think we have a lot of opportunities as far as like, you know, what school we go to, who we want to be friends with, who, who we want to be in a relationship with. And I think that's just the best part about America, like the ability to just do so many different things. Whereas I feel like if I was still in India, I'd be kind of um, sidelined into one area. Yeah. Definitely. And I think um, you may have a different experience than I do, but I'm sure you may have the, in, in a lot of areas, you may have the same experience as I do as, as someone being born in India, you know, lived first 25 years in India and then coming here. So it's definitely very interesting how, you know, this Desi community is yeah. so diverse within itself. Mm -hmm. And India is so diverse. Like, I don't think people mm -hmm. just 
they don't even recognize or realize how how diverse we are and mm -hmm. talking about diversity i know you know it's such a big part of like you know stem and this conversation that we have in her stem story um but how was your experience in college so were you one of the only people in the class uh, or mm -hmm. how how was that journey like in college, I was definitely one of the few girls in my classes. So I was studying electrical engineering and my school had it set up in a way where I was in the department of electrical and computer engineering. So this means I not only got to take electrical engineering classes, but also computer engineering classes, which also tended to have like one or two women in a class of like 50, mm. which isn't a lot. Um, but I, I would say that I was lucky in the sense that I found really great male peers who respected me, um, who were willing to work with me and collaborate with me. And I'm just so grateful that I met these people because they really helped shape like of the foundation of my college career. Like they made me feel like, you know, there were so many potential and, and opportunities for me, even though I was a woman and like part of the minority. Yeah, for sure. I think we can't grow in these professions without allies. Right. And, and yeah. I think, so many conversations seem like they're echo chambers, but I'm glad you bring that point up because we can't have, you know, we can't grow unless we have allies and unless we have these partnerships. And then we also talk about them because mm -hmm. yes, there is a lot of things that need to be improved and there's bias and, you know, there are bad people in this world, but I think we yeah. need to celebrate the good ones because there's yeah. so many of them. <laughs> yeah, there are. Yeah, so awesome. So tell me about this life-changing story, getting to the meat of things. Tell me about this life-changing story that you have with Bitcoin from, from your college days. Yeah, so when I was in college, um, I was an engineering student, as I mentioned, and pretty much everybody in our engineering school had or knew about Bitcoin. So like you weren't cool unless you had it. And it was just kind of like a fun thing that people just owned. And eventually it catapulted into something a lot greater than that. So when I was in my senior year of college in 2017, Bitcoin underwent a bull run. So in the beginning of the year, it was around like $2,000. And that's when I first, like I bought a whole Bitcoin because you can actually buy parts of a Bitcoin, not the full um, entity. And then it later on, it catapulted all the way to $19,000. And I eventually liquidated um, that amount because I wanted to pay for college tuition. I had, you know, like college student expenses to take care of. So I did that. And it was just like such a life changing experience, like to be that young and to make that much money and to take that risk was um, something that was so profound in my life. And it really also not only that, but like it made me feel so much more confident in investing because I didn't even know what investing was. And I didn't realize that buying Bitcoin was actually an investment. So as I got older, I was thinking, you know, how do I continue to make returns like this um, and find a way to like diversify my portfolio? And Bitcoin gave me that first taste. And I'm just so thankful for that. Yeah. And I'm sure you've continued ever since, right? Yes. Yes, I have. <laughs> yeah. So how did you overcome? And I know maybe your peers were helping or maybe just being in the space of tech was probably a, a, a factor. But how did you overcome this risk of like, you know, as a student, only, like having $2,000 and like figuring out maybe I would need this versus mm -hmm. let's put it here and take a risk. So, you know, how did you sort of overcome that fear? Yeah. So I was so young at the time, like I think I was like 20 or 21 years old where I wasn't really thinking about the negative downside. All I was thinking was like, you know what, this is so cool. Like all my friends are taking part in this. And like, you get that like mass adoption kind of like vibe from it too, right? Like everyone else in my friend circle is in it. Why not me? So I was thinking in that same way and I invested in it and it ended up being so good for me. And I, if to go back in time, like if I were to tell myself, you know, like, Hey, you should think about this more thoroughly. I guess like losing $2,000 would have been not the best thing ever, but at the same time, like it was something that I was willing to do. Um, and I saw a potential, the technology, and that's why I invested. Yeah. And so I think investment is such a great topic. And now you couple it with cryptocurrency. I think it can be definitely very intimidating for somebody new. So like, I'll just take my example and I would invite the audience if we have more live people, please comment that you're also uh, in, in the same boat as me. But but investment itself is scary uh, because we have limited resources. And then you add a complicated technology that I don't understand. So how would you convince someone like me to 
go for it or maybe even educate me um, that how do I find these opportunities and, and, and take an educated risk? That is a great question. So always do your research, always look at the market data. Even before I invested in Bitcoin, I looked at the market data across like the last five years and Bitcoin tends to go through like um, a lot of volatile swings. Like sometimes it will reach a max point and then it will drop. So kind of like try to look at those um, data points and see like what's the return over the past year. So for one example, um, in the past year, Bitcoin has gone up 800% just wow. in the past year, which is quite a lot. It's it's better than any other um, stock asset or anything like that. So just look at that data. And if, if you see yourself, like if you wanna continue on that path, then definitely consider investing in it. But I would also consider talking to a financial advisor if you have the means to do that, because um, sometimes you might need that additional handholding and that person can really give you good recommendations. Oh yeah. For sure. And I think the other thing I always notice about c- certain investment portfolios or investment products that anytime I find out about them, they're already at the peak. <laughs> so yeah. it's like, wait, did I miss the boat? So would you say that we missed the boat on Bitcoin or are we just getting started? So I would say that I'm feeling very optimistic about Bitcoin. I obviously have no idea where it's going to end up the next year. But there is a lot of market data from a lot of like leading asset management firms. For example, I follow uh, a company called Pantera Capital, which tends to do predictions for what Bitcoin's going to hit in the next month or so or the next year, actually. And every time they've been very spot on. So I actually just look at that. And I'm like, okay, is it is it gonna what, what is it gonna be next month? And it actually tends to be very accurate to what their prediction is. Maybe it's off by like a couple thousand. But same around the same ballpark. So I would just recommend like looking at that information and then using that as like a guiding light. Mm -hmm. For sure. And I think, would you agree and talking about financial literacy as well, like coupled with with this topic of investment, would you agree that people should maybe save first and invest later? Or would you say invest first and save later? Because I think that's another question on everyone's mind. Which one should I do first? (laughs) Yeah. So I think it really depends on what you want to do. So obviously I'm not a financial advisor, so I can't give granular advice, but think about what you want to do in your future. Like some people have goals, like they want to retire by the time they're 35. If that is something you want to do, then consider investing because investing over time um, can like really hedge against inflation and you can receive returns that you wouldn't if you just put it in your checking account, right? Because that's not really doing anything for you. So think about your goals. Like when do you want to retire? Do you want to be a millionaire? Or do you just want to make a little extra money on the side? I love that. That's a great, great advice. And then Shivani here has a question for us, which I love this question, which is very similar to what we were saying before. But um, but she asks, definitely an intimidating risk reward balance scenario. Did you ever read books on investing or cryptocurrency? If not, are there any particular resources uh, you'd recommend to a newbie? Which, you know, I'm also on board with you, Shivani. I love to get a lot of my initial knowledge from books. And I think they can be a great resource to sort of start that journey of education. Yeah, I so when I was starting with Bitcoin, I didn't read any books. I was reading more blog posts and Reddit uh, pages and Twitter. And that is because there's there's actually not that many books about Bitcoin, unfortunately, because it's still a very nascent technology. Um, So I would recommend starting out there, but also just check out like general investing books. So one book that I recommend is Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Mm -hmm. Um, it's like one of those like classic books that talks about like how you need to reduce your liabilities and increase your assets for you to have like a fruitful financial life. And by liabilities, I mean, things like loans, credit card debt, um, any like, you know, buying cars stuff, you have to be able to reduce those liabilities and actually invest in creating assets. So assets are things that eventually appreciate over time. And those are tend to be like real estate. Um, the stock market, any other like mutual funds that you might be investing in. So definitely check out that book as a general investment tool. And then if you want content on crypto, I actually post a lot on my blog and my Instagram page. So a lot of it is just like educational stuff, um, not any like prescriptive advice. So if that's what you're looking for, definitely check my website out. Yes, I love that. And 
I think Rich Dad Poor Dad is a great book. I know it's like sort of cliched, um, but I remember reading it in eighth grade and I didn't get anything. <laughs> so yeah. I had to read it again, like 18 years later where I'm like, okay, now I can understand what it says. Um, yeah. But that being said, I think, as you said, it's a nascent technology and that brings up a really important question that is on everyone's mind, especially mm -hmm. minorities who have the who I assume have, you know, limited funds and limited resources. So if they're going to invest in something, it's important that, you know, there is this security of at least not, uh, again, investment is always going to be risky, but there's this certain security of like, is this here for long term or what's the longevity of this? So uh, yeah. what would be your comments on that? So it really just depends on like what you're looking for in that investment, right? Like a lot of like I have invested in certain cryptos where I'm just making a quick buck, like I'll buy it and then I will sell it like a couple months later. Like, you know, I need this liquid cash to pay off my car loan or to pay my rent. So it just depends on your financial goals. If you're looking for something long term, like longevity, um, I know a lot of folks tend to invest in like funds or ETFs. There's like so many good ETFs to invest in. And to give like a high level of what an ETF is, is they're just like a basket of stocks um, mm -hmm. and they make up one entire entity. So like one um, ETF that I invest in is called VGT. So the Vanguard Technology Index Fund. Um, so this is like a basket of like Microsoft, Cisco, NVIDIA, um, and a bunch of other tech stocks. And they tend to do, they tend to outperform the market because tech is here to stay. It's going to be here for a long time. Um, so I started like investing in those index funds and they tend to do well over time. So I, I personally enjoy um, investing in index funds and I think it'd be scary, but like uh, definitely like do your research, like look at the market data. Um, there's so much information. Like I, I like to use Vanguard because they're so good at, with their graphs. And if you're like engineering minded, like that's what clicks with you and it clicks with me too so definitely check those out and see what the return is year by year i love that um and one question that i forgot to ask and as you were saying it i was like wait i need to uh ask her this what is the difference between bitcoin and how many types of cryptocurrencies are out there yeah yeah there's there's so many out there but to simplify it bitcoin is the first real life application of blockchain which is a way to store data in blocks. Um, and it's just a very profound technology. And this is a way, to, and the application of it is to eventually be able to use like a programmable API to program like escrows, dividends, um, car payments, car loans. And so that way we don't have to worry about banks actually issuing this money. We can actually like do it ourselves, this transaction. Um, and that's what Bitcoin is. It was the first real life application of it. And all the other cryptocurrencies are derivatives of Bitcoin. So they use the blockchain technology, but they have different applications. So one other big crypto is a, something called Ethereum, which is commonly used for smart contracts. And now I think we're seeing like NFTs, which are non-fungible tokens. Those are like artworks, um, which are also using Ethereum. So the best way that I... Ethereum is like, you know how like there's like the app store, like Apple has an app store. Um, and then within it, there are like apps, right? They they live in the app store ecosystem. But apps to thrive in this ecosystem, they have to get approved by the app store, which is like some Apple team, right? Imagine Ethereum being that, but with no approval. Like anyone can be in the app store. You don't have to like meet the certain criteria. Yeah, that sounds so much like Matrix. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, yeah, it does. Yeah. In the Matrix. <laughs> um, yeah. That 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 is really cool and mm -hmm. really like sounds very futuristic. And that brings me to another question on like the money transactions. We're still doing dollars to. We're still exchanging dollars to get cryptocurrencies. And I yeah. guess if I'm not wrong, the future is going all the way to cryptocurrency, not having the dollar involved um, and making it a currency in itself. Correct. So. I think like, I think there's like so many arguments for what's going to happen to the dollar, right? Like there's always going to be some fiat currency, I would say, like whether it's, you know, the dollar, rupee, the pound, there's always going to be something. I think in our lifetimes, it might still be there. Um, but I think the most important part is like 
people are going to be less reliant on the dollar or fiat currency. They might rely more on like Bitcoin or another cryptocurrency to make a transaction. And I think I think it's very exciting because nobody knows what the future is going to hold, right? Maybe Bitcoin is just a bubble and it's, you know, not going to work out. Or maybe there's another cryptocurrency that isn't even around yet that's going to beat Bitcoin and surpass it. We just like don't really know, but it's exciting to like watch the trends and see what could potentially happen. Yeah, I love that. And again, so far, we're still using our dollar to buy the currency and power it. And then, you know, hopefully in the future, it looks a little different. But I do understand the case for transparency, right? the case that cryptocurrencies are making or blockchain is making for just the transparency in the system where um, hopefully we can lead um, towards a more equal equal world, uh, a more uh, economically um, transparent world, because right now, we I don't think we have that. Yeah. And then another thing I want to add is like a lot of people don't realize this, but enrolling for a bank account in America, there is actually a lot of like operational overhead. Like you have to have a social security number. You have to have an address. You have to have like all these documents. And if you're someone who comes from like an underprivileged background, like a, like a village in like Africa or India, you might not be able to even get a bank account because they won't offer it to you because you don't have those documents. So what Bitcoin does is it democratizes access to these underprivileged and overlooked people who don't have these documents and not because there's anything wrong with them, just because they don't have the means to do it. So now they can actually participate in the capital markets with Bitcoin, whereas in our traditional system, they're not really able to. Yeah. Interesting and at the same time challenging to like how we do things right now and definitely brings up a lot of other questions in terms of like how do you then control money laundering and how do you then control yeah. crim criminal money but i'm sure <laughs> i'm sure we're all going to see that unfold yes. as you said maybe in our lifetimes or maybe not um but i think there is this really important topic that i want to touch you know what do you think cryptocurrency can do for women in tech or just women in general right how can we use it to um to empower our lives and careers yeah, I would say it's a great way to build generational wealth. So this means that like if you are someone who like I'm the first person in my family to invest in Bitcoin. Um, so for me, this is a way for me to my wealth in a way that like I can like look back and say, hey, I made this like crazy investment in, you know, my early 20s and it ended up paying off. And I think like I, I don't know what how it's going to unfold. Of course. But so far I've been very content with what I've received um, for my initial investments. And I'm hoping it continues to go on that path. But I think like the generational wealth part is so important because like if you just, if you've never heard about investing, you had to learn it all from scratch. This is like the perfect way for you to kind of get like your feet wet. I love that. So what would be some websites that people can buy Bitcoins at or uh, where people can start trading in cryptocurrency? Hey. <laughs> Go ahead. Okay, perfect. Did you hear my question? You said some websites, correct? To, yes. to understand yes. Bitcoin better. Yeah. No, I was saying where yeah. can we start? Where can we start buying bitcoins and cryptocurrencies? Oh. Yeah. So I I use there's a bit, there's many brokerage platforms that you can use. I personally use something called Coinbase. So this is one of the larger uh, brokerage platforms to buy and sell cryptocurrencies. Um, they actually recently just went public last week. So very exciting to see that um, the business model works and there's like a lot of potential in the platform. So I definitely um, recommend like just looking into Coinbase and seeing if it like uh, fits your needs. And there's a lot of other platforms too, like Gemini, um kraken and like voyager so just kind of figure out like which one works best for you and then go from there i love that and make sure you get fully thoroughly educated before you take any risks because yeah. um i guess as engineers if there's one thing we all have learned is how to take calculated risks so yeah. as you were saying before like go through the data look at what's going on connect mm -hmm. with nikki learn more about you know sort of include that in your daily feed because so many times we're so focused on like the makeup videos and the dance videos and, and yeah. there's so much like plethora of knowledge online today um mm -hmm. if you if you follow someone who looks like you which is the reason why this is so important because 
when such complicated information is shared to us by people who we don't trust or who we don't look like, then we don't have enough trust. And I think when we don't have trust, it's harder for us to like, you know, understand. So the way you explained it to me, I am kind of sold on it just because, <laughs> you know, just because I could see myself in you. And I think, I think that's the, that's the very important part. Um, now with that being said, what would you say is the importance of having women involved in the development of cryptocurrency? So how many women in tech, women in crypto, like what is that scenario like? And, you know, how can people get into this from like the back end side? That's a great question too. So when the stock market was around, it was typically like men investing in it. Right. And when, when the whole population is just men, they tend to teach each other like, Hey, this is a good stock. Like, this is what I'm doing. Like, you know, this is how you build up your portfolio. And women weren't really included in that equation. So in that sense, we've been left out of this like market for such a long time. And now we have to catch up and we have to catch up by like decades of years. You know what I mean? Like that takes a long time. Um, whereas I think like crypto is like, like I said, so nascent, it's so new, like Bitcoin came out in 2009 and Ethereum came out in 2015. So they're still in their budding stages. But the unfortunate part is only 15% of crypto investors are women. And I definitely want to see more women participate in this because I think women can have a great voice in cryptocurrencies because they can talk about how it's going to reduce um, the, the ability to increase your wealth and also increase generational wealth. And I also think like, it's important to have women in like the board seats for some of these cryptocurrencies, because there tends to be like a crypto board for each of the coins. And I think they, t I don't know the statistic, but they're probably male dominated, I'm assuming. Um, so I think that's another thing that could happen as we have more female investors, like more women who participate in the roadmap of how each, um, how each currency is going to change and evolve over time. Yeah, for sure. And I think, again, the whole case for women in tech is the same way that we need more women to participate on all sides so that we can create technologies that work for everyone and that can actually push all of us forward. Because when technologies and solutions work for the meekest in the group, then they work for everybody, right? And if they work only for the, you know, the tier one population, then, you know, we sort of miss out on the on the genius that resides probably, you know, uh, somewhere somewhere in the lower tiers of the economy yeah. and even society in general. So, so exciting. Yeah. I'm so excited about this conversation. Um, before we let you go, I would love to hear where can our people, where can our audience find you? But oh, before that, look, I am out of practice because I haven't <laughs> been doing interviews for a little bit. I have to ask you, what's your favorite book? Oh my gosh. Um, I have so many, but right now I'm actually reading the originals by Adam Grant. Um, so this is how like, um, people who think outside of the box actually shape the trajectory of the future. So I thought this was a very important book for me to read right now because me being a female crypto investor, like, you know, it's not a common theme and sometimes I can feel out of place because there isn't a huge community for me. But in this book, he talks about how like, the people who really shape society are the ones who like think and do things that are like out of the norm. And it makes me feel like, you know, I'm like normal <laughs> doing whatever I'm doing. So I would definitely check out that book. He talks, he, the best part about that book is like, he's a Wharton professor in like psychology and marketing. So he talks about like the psychological, interesting ways that people think through a solution, how they rationalize and how to like manage like risk and reward. And I think those are important conversations because it can be like a good stepping stone and like foundational knowledge for you to even start investing. So definitely check that out if you have time. Yeah, that's awesome. I love that. And I love Adam Grant. So I know it has been showing up everywhere and I haven't yeah. got my hands on it, but I'll take your word on it and get started. So <laughs> Thank you again, Nikki, for your time and your knowledge and for everything you're doing in this niche space. Because as you said, you know, we need people like you to take the cur courageous steps to step into this and create space for others. You definitely mm -hmm. educated me a lot and I'm sure you educated our audience as well. Now tell us where can we all find you and connect with you? 
Yeah. So I have an Instagram called hello, Nikki B. Feel free to follow me. Um, DM me if you have any questions. And then I also post a lot of content on my blog post, which is also hello, Nikki B.com. Um, I just offer like anything from like educational material to sometimes I even post memes. Um, so if you're into memes and emojis, like definitely check out my two platforms. I love that. And we'll share all the links to your socials and your website in the episode notes. And thank you again for joining us live and for making time for this conversation. I'm sure it was so beneficial for all of us. I'm back. I think I'm back. (laughs) (laughs) No worries. Awesome. I, I didn't hear the last part, but thank you so much for having me. This was so much fun. I really enjoyed it. And yeah, please feel free to add me on like LinkedIn, Instagram, or my blog. I love that. Awesome. Thank you so much, Nikki. And that was Nikki with her amazing STEM story. Please follow her on all her social media platforms. And don't forget to check out everything you can about cryptocurrency, because as Nikki said, we need to create generational wealth and have a voice in this new emerging technology. Thank you so much for listening. This is her STEM story, and I'm your host, Prasha Dutra. Subscribe, rate, and review this podcast on all podcasting platforms, and join us again next Sunday live on LinkedIn and YouTube. Bye-bye.